Thank you. An issue which is uh, close to all of our hearts, um, the, uh, the current impact of U.S. foreign policy and bilateral relations uh, in Mexico itself. Um, back in January of this year, shortly after inauguration, I published a, a short op-ed with The Guardian newspaper about uh, the dangers of reigniting old fears and hatreds in, uh, in Mexico. And of course, it's been a recurring theme throughout the, uh, the first year of the Trump administration, is that people have talked at length about uh, the dangers of uh, anti-Yanquismo in, uh, in, in, in Mexico as a reaction to uh, the aggressive foreign policy and statements of President Trump towards uh, our southern neighbor. And so uh, recently when, uh, uh, when Andrew Paxman um, from Mexico City's CIDE University contacted me and said that he'd be interested in coming up to lead a discussion on this issue of gringophobia um, in historic perspective, I thought that it would be a very, very nice way for us to frame our current understanding of what's going on in Mexico in historical terms. Now, new to the program, as you'll see on the, uh, the sheet that you all have uh, in front of you, um, we took a, an executive decision this morning to, to add in uh, my dear colleague, Chris Wilson, who is currently working on a paper um, looking, examining uh, public opinion in Mexico on the United States and in the United States on Mexico, doing a comparative uh, study. And so uh, I thought it would be very interesting that after Andrew uh, speaks, that uh, Chris would be able to come <coughs> in and, and give some commentary. Let me just tell you a little bit. You have uh, Andrew's uh, uh, biography here, but let me just tell you a little bit about him. Like, like me, he's a, uh, a wayward Brit, um, somebody who found their way to Mexico um, via a, uh, a long and interesting path. Um, found your way to Mexico, you got out of Mexico, and you went back to Mexico, um, which some people don't uh, always do. I mean, um, and you found your career success down there. Now, Andrew has uh, published a number of uh, important works, but the latest of these is a fascinating study of Jenkins of Mexico. For those of you who don't know the Jenkins family, who are the founders, of course, of Mexico City University and the uh, Universidad de las Americas, as it eventually became out in, uh, in Puebla, um, a very, very uh, interesting story of the family's history in Mexico. Um, it's, a, it's a huge book, um, but this will accompany you on long journeys uh, across the Atlantic if you go to visit uh, Andrew uh, and his family when he's back there, okay? So uh, a terrific uh, uh, book for you to, uh, to pick up. So um, the idea of today is that, uh, you know, you guys enjoy your lunch. Andrew will entertain us with some, uh, some ideas and inform us. Chris will give some commentary, and then we're going to open it up for, for conversation. So uh, without any further ado, Andrew, I, uh, I, I just tell you the podium is yours. Thank you very much. <coughs> I'd like to start by thanking Duncan for the very kind invitation. This is my first time speaking, or indeed setting foot, in the Wilson Center. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Chris for very kindly stepping up to uh, accompany me in this uh, talk and discussion, <coughs> I propose speaking for about uh, 25 minutes um, or so, 25 to half an hour, and, and I think that'll give enough time for discussion. Right? Um, this talk is, paced, is based partly on my book, as, uh, as Duncan just mentioned, Jenkins of Mexico, How a Southern Farm Boy Became a Mexican Magnet. <coughs> One of the themes of which is how an anti-American discourse has been used in Mexico, chiefly but not only by politicians, to try to shape the national mood, or orient policymakers, or shore up a political base. And this has been the case since at least the 1840s. This man, Jenkins, very briefly, was William Jenkins, who started out as a Tennessee farm boy, won a scholarship to Vanderbilt, dropped out a year later to elope with his Southern Belle girlfriend, <coughs> headed first for Texas and then for Mexico. That was in 1901, and 50 or so years later, he was probably the richest man in the country. How he got there is a story of investments in textiles, of property trading during the Mexican Revolution, of sugar planting, of banking, and of coming to dominate the film industry during the golden age of Mexican cinema. It's also a story of forging the right political relationships 
firstly, to protect his assets in an unstable revolutionary environment, and secondly, to get ahead as a union buster and as a monopolist. I'm going to start with an episode from the early 1990s, at which time I was a reporter for the Mexico City News. <clears throat> a quarter century ago, Mexicans were debating about tying their economy more closely to the United States through the Trade and Investment Pact that would come to be known as NAFTA. Mexico's government had abandoned decades of official rhetoric about national sovereignty in order to promote a neoliberal agenda. At one point during the NAFTA negotiations in 1992, a cartoonist weighed in with a deft counter. He drew a blonde and freckled businessman with a suitcase full of cash and a stars and stripes tie, blithely declaring, no, we are not interested in the whole of Pemex. We'd keep the petroleum and you'd keep the Mexicans. The illustrator was Rafael Barajas, a genial provocateur in Mexico's top left-wing daily, La Jornada. Pemex was the state petroleum monopoly, a symbol of economic sovereignty for more than 50 years. And the gist of the cartoon was this. Those smiling gringos are not to be trusted. With this trade deal, they'll make off with our oil and leave thousands unemployed. While a country that, was, that once lost half of its territory to a US invasion might well mistrust its neighbors, this image was simple fear-mongering. Oil production was never on the table during the talks that led to NAFTA. However, Barajas, better known by his pen name El Fiscon, had tuned into a local tradition of bad-mouthing Americans for political purchase. His sketch echoed a campaign among Mexico's left to build public sentiment against NAFTA. And when that effort failed, many of its voices returned to a more visceral anti-Americanism. In 1995, once an influx of cheap US corn and a national economic crash prompted droves of poor Mexicans to head to the United States for work, Barajas depicted a line of them rushing the US border Astride took a, stood a giant Uncle Sam, urinating on them. <clears throat> Once again in La Jornada. <laughs> <laughs> Fast forward 22 years, and Mexico's left continues to hum an anti-Yankee tune. In January of this year, President Enrique Peña Nieto opened gasoline prices to market forces. The resulting 20% hike was both a step towards the entry of foreign gas stations and a top-up for the Treasury's depleted coffers. It prompted weeks of outrage. La Jornada reported on the protests one day by splashing its front page with a woman setting fire to old glory. The simplistic subtext, the gas hike is the fault of the gringos. The newspaper's take was a deeply oversimplified reading of the situation, but it made sense in the context of what I call gringophobia, a strain of Mexican nationalism, at times muted, at other times pronounced, that views the United States and its citizens as objects of fear, disdain, and blame for the country's ills, and that at certain times is generated or resurrected by political leaders for ideological, policy, or electoral purposes. Mexico today is ripe for overt gringophobia, and two singular forces are making it so. One is Donald J. Trump. Since his campaign igniting murderers and rapist speech of 2015, Trump has had no rivals as the American that Mexicans most love to hate. US media often play up the lighter side of this loathing, old folks bashing yellow-headed piñatas, narcos catapulting bales of marijuana over the border wall that Trump has promised to extend. In Mexico, the mirth has rather fizzled. Between, between Trump's nomination and, inaug and inaug inauguration, the peso lost a fifth of its value. Cowing before the president-elect, automaker Ford canceled a planned assembly plant in Mexico, in San Luis Potosí. The, the economy is anemic, and with Trump's insistence on either tearing up or toning down NAFTA, who knows which, the prospects look uncertain. 
We saw this again five weeks ago when Trump again threatened to tear up NAFTA. The peso took another dive. This is more than just macroeconomic data. This hits Mexicans in the pocket. A falling peso causes inflation. And last winter, as Mexico's central bank sought to defend the peso against the Trump effect by pushing up interest rates on several occasions, most people who have a mortgage soon found themselves paying about 30% more. The other force is, of course, Andrés Manuel López Obrador. A former mayor of Mexico City and a nationalist populist stalwart of the left. Known to disciples, detractors, and neutrals alike by his initials, AMLO, López Obrador made his first bid for president in 2006 and lost by less than one percentage point. Part of his allure at the time owed to his opposition to U.S. influence. The Iraq War had made George W. Bush deeply unpopular to Mexicans, for whom invasions, understandably, are a no-no. On the campaign trail, AMLO, who was then 52, boasted that he spoke no English and had never set foot in the United States. In the 2012 election, his second place finish was more distant, thanks chiefly to long-running support for Peña Nieto from the TV, from the TV Biomath Televisa. But, did it, but it did not help AMLO that he no longer had an internationally toxic US president to make noises about. And as many, as you know, as many of you know, next July, Mexicans will vote again. And this year, López Obrador has generally been polling as the front runner. Political observers agree that the greatest beneficiary of Trump's election by far is AMLO. We'll return to that subject uh, towards the end. And I want to talk about a history of anti-Americanism, the, 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 the background to, to what we're seeing uh, in the papers and in um, certain uh, political rhetoric uh, uh, this year. AMLO's anti-Americanism is not new. Time and again in Mexican history, gringophobia has been used for political gain. The trope originated in the 1820s, Mexico's debut decade as a republic, when US Ambassador Joel Poinsett meddled in politics in favor of local liberals. It mushroomed in the 1840s with the Mexican-American War, known in Mexico as the US Intervention, which ended with the loss of half of Mexico's territory. The war and the massive land grab that it engineered angered all elites, but especially the conservatives. In their rivalry with liberals, conservatives nurtured an anti-Americanism that went beyond a call to defend la patria. As historian Charles Hale once put it, a principal tenet of fully elaborated conservatism was a deep hostility to the United States. Mexico was now seen to have superior Hispanic traditions and cultural values. Even before the US intervention, a prominent conservative ideologue, Lucas Alaman, argued that unlike Americans, we, we Mexicans, are not a people of merchants and adventurers, scum and refuse of all countries whose only mission is to usurp the property of the miserable Indians. He's, he wrote this, by the way, just a, a few weeks before the US invasion. Evoking the medieval occupation of Christian Spain by Muslim Africans, the main mid-century conservative newspaper suggested a pan-Hispanic alliance against Americans, whom it called the New Islamites. A pamphleteer claimed that Protestantism led to, quote, sedition, disorder, cruelty, blood, and death. Conservatives lost the upper hand in the 1860s thanks to a fateful alliance with the French-imposed Emperor Maximilian. The ensuing age of liberalism witnessed a building of railroads and revival of mines led by U.S. investors and employing many Americans. The rich whined about an invading swarm of ants that brandished revolvers and frequented bar rooms, and they satirized the rudeness of the Yankee workers with whom they sometimes had to share train compartments. But outside the contact zones of mining camps and oil fields, resentment was limited to elite circles. All that changed after 1910, when Mexico was plunged into a decade-long revolution that produced what was arguably the world's first socialist 
Constitution. It was now the left, much more than the right, that waved the banner of national sovereignty. And gringophobia, gringophobia evolved too, entering popu popular culture on a massive scale. Folk ballads known as corridos began to mock Americans for their lack of manliness, their greed and their cruelty, and their contempt for Mexican workers. One balladeer opined, the gringo is very despicable and our eternal enemy. Another claimed that Americans wished to exploit all things American, all things Mexican, from oil and silver to the country's beautiful women. Yet another observed that unemployed oilers in Tampico were so angry, quote, they only want to eat gringos, raw and also roasted. Political cartoonists drew American investors with large girths, sneering smiles, and outsized diamond rings. A literary excoriation of Yankee business activity proliferated, as it did throughout Latin America. Unlike ordinary Americans, whom novelists often absolved, investors were stereotyped as cold, racist, immoral, sometimes lustful. Mexico's nascent film industry started to depict the exploitative U.S. businessman as a stock character. While much of this was spontaneous, some of the new sentiment was fostered by the state. School textbooks fingered U.S. greed as a cause of the Mexican-American War. Diego Rivera, the muralist, was invited to paint at the Education Ministry, and his frescoes included a group portrait of J.D. Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan Jr., and Henry Ford. Rivera made them into wizened fiends, dining on stock market ticker tape in what an American diplomat at the time called a display of virulent and blatant hatred of the United States. Mexico's new rulers needed a, new, uh, needed a useful bugaboo, for their biggest concern in the 1920s and 30s was holding both state and nation together. The 10-year revolution was followed by a series of lesser rebellions that threatened to topple the government. Permanently short of cash, the state had limited options. But one thing it could easily do to satisfy the Constitution's radical promises and to strengthen its tenuous hold was to seize US assets. Per one estimate, foreigners, mostly Americans, had come to own 27% of Mexico's surface area by 1910. Expropriations became the order of the day, the land typically redistributed among the peasant and rancher majority. And the policy reached a populist climax in 1938 with the seizure of the US-UK-owned oil companies. The president who made that jackpot-hitting call, Lázaro Cárdenas, remains the most popular figure in 20th century Mexican history. Cárdenas could pull off the oil seizure in great part thanks to the US government. Under Franklin Roosevelt, the United States had nurtured a Latin American good neighbor policy, following decades as the backyard bully. For example, grabbing Puerto Rico from Spain, invading Veracruz during the Mexican Revolution, occupying Cuba, Nicaragua, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic, and so on. Thanks in large part to this good neighbor policy, Mexico entered World War II on the side of the Allies, despite popular misgivings, even incomprehension. In some small towns, radio listeners greeted the declaration of war with, Viva Mexico, death to the gringos. Afterwards, good neighborly harmony came to, came to be relegated in favor of Cold War anti-communism. Modern Mexico's first civilian president, Miguel Alamán, depicted at left, was happy to sing the new tune. A conservative, he led the ruling Institutional Revolutionary Party, or PRI, in a firmly pro-business, pro-US direction that, despite some populist flourishes, has remained the party's MO to this day. Parenthetically, Peña Nieto's dubi dubious attempt to appease Dom Donald Trump in, in uh, August last year by inviting him to Mexico during his campaign belongs within this rhetorically uneven but practically deferential tradition. The PRI, which ruled in, uh, uninterrupted from 1929 until 2000, was a very broad church. Its left wing grew ever unhappier with the turn their revolution was taking. Matters came to a head in 1959, when Fidel Castro's rebels rode into Havana and started imposing a state-directed economy, 
Leftists hailed the Cuban model as a reminder of abandoned ideals. Growing hostility to Castro, uh, growing US hostility to Castro only bolstered their case. Seeking to fix their anger on a symbol of all that had gone wrong, so to sway both the pre and the public towards a renewed embrace of socialism, many writers and politicians opted for one William O. Jenkins. As I mentioned earlier, Jenkins had moved from Tennessee to Mexico in 1901 and made successive fortunes in textiles, property trading, sugar, banking, and the film industry. He had done so through a complex mix of entrepreneurial savvy and befriending the powerful, chiefly among the right wing of the pre. In 1960, Time magazine would call him the richest man in Mexico. Between 1959 and 1951, with debates over Cuba at a peak, Jenkins was subject to a, subjected to a barrage. One magazine, this one, claimed that Jenkins ruled over his adoptive state of Puebla, murdering opponents and imposing governors and mayors. As owner of Mexico's number two bank, he had exploited thousands of employees, and the fact that 70% of them were female made him a great national pimp. One profile of Jenkins pondered, why was the most pernicious foreigner that we have allowed to remain in Mexico? Surely because he had bribed several presidents. The cover caricatured him as a despot with its title blaring, William Jenkins, Lord and Master of Mexico. The most influential left-wing organ of the day, Politica, was more broadly gringophobic. A 1960 photo essay about a sugar plantation that the American had, uh, had once owned, A Hell on Mexican Soil, was the title, claimed that the estate was still controlled by Jenkins, of whom it said, the greatest devil is blonde. Mexican caricatures of U.S. businessmen always, almost always made them fair-haired. Other media called, uh, took to calling Jenkins the pernicious Yankee. Mexico's top daily at the time, Excelsior, put President Cardenas on its front page, railing against Jenkins as a latifundista, or large-scale landowner, a monopolist and a foreign capitalist, for buying up land for a new plantation in Michoacán. The word latifundista alluded to the late 19th century when well-connected planters had gobbled up small holdings almost at will. Jenkins was living proof that Mexico was reverting to its dark pre-revolutionary -re -pre past. While some of the attacks against Jenkins were accurate, others were exaggerated, still others fabricated. Even the truths were often distortions of a sort, as they tended to ignore how Jenkins' busting of unions, arming of vigilante gunmen, evading of taxes, monopolistic bullying, uh, bullying of rivals, and backing of authoritarian politicians was standard practice among Mexico's business elite. Jenkins had become one of them, for he never returned to the United States and did not repatriate profits. But he took more plaque because he was a gringo. The battle for the soul of the pre was won by the right. Continuity triumphed when President López Mateos, following ruling party practice, handpicked a conservative authoritarian, Gustavo Díaz Ordaz, as his successor. But Jenkins' vilification mattered. It contributed to an ever more shrill rhetorical, sh rhetorical struggle. Echoed in the streets with student marches, chants of Cuba si, Yankees no, and occasional killings. The battle polarized Mexico for years, and it inexorably arrived at a bloody outcome in 1968. As many of you know, 10 days before the Mexico City Olympics, the army halted a left-wing protest movement by killing dozens, perhaps hundreds, of students. For more than two decades now, Mexico and the United States have drawn generally closer. NAFTA played a huge part, though not entirely as its neoliberal architects intended. Its mid-1990s opening of Mexico to subsidized U.S. corn prompted several million peasants and their families no longer able to sell the surplus from their tiny corn fields to migrate north. In turn, years of back-and-forth movement by these migrants also by Mexican tourists, 
have tempered old prejudices about the United States. Millions of Mexicans have now been there and seen the country for themselves. But two key factors keep gringophobia in play. First, believing the worst of the United States remains an article of faith within some sectors of society, such as the many faculty in the social sciences at the big public universities, along with media such as La Jornada, as we saw earlier, and the popular combative newsweekly Proceso. Second, national opinion remains subject to huge mood swings. In 2003, following Bush's invasion of Iraq, pollsters Latino Barometro found that just 41% of Mexicans had a positive view of the United States, while 58% held a negative view. 13 years later, during Obama's final year, only 15% expressed a negative view, while 76% held a positive one. Such polls suggest that a major determinant of Mexican opinion is the rhetoric and reported actions of the occupant of the White House. Moreover, not counting the don't knows, Latino Barometro last year found that just 12% of Mexicans held, ne held a negative opinion of Obama, while 94% disliked Trump. I've never actually met one of the remaining 6%. Findings released by the Pew Center in September showed similar results. More Mexicans view the United States negatively than at any time over the past 15 years. Two-thirds of Mexicans, 65% to be precise, were found to, to hold an unfavorable opinion of the United States, a proportion more than doubling since the 29% of two years ago. Further, this dive in public opinion appears to owe greatly to the presidency and rhetoric of Trump. A reading again affirmed by a general correlation between views of the USA and views of the president during the Bush, Obama, and Trump presidencies. It's not a perfect correlation, but the correlation is definitely there. So with Trump in the Oval Office, Mexico may never have been as fertile a field for politicized gringophobia as it is today. Historically, or if we look at prior examples from history, that the land conquered by General Winfield Scott in 1847 was less a nation than a map of ill-connected states, much of its populace likely oblivious of the invasion until well after it had happened. Again, in 1914, when U.S. Marines occupied Veracruz, news still likely only reached a majority, uh, a, min a minority, I'm sorry, for 85% of Mexicans at the time remained illiterate. Only the Cold War peak of the 1960s offers a proximate parallel. But Mexico had no electoral democracy then. Today, three parties jostle for supremacy and for next year's presidential election. Peña Nieto's ruling three, the conservative PAN, which governed from 2000 to 2012, and AMLO's relative upstart party, Morena, an acronym for Movement for National Regeneration that, not coincidentally, echoes the Spanish word for dark-skinned person. So far this year, López Obrador has been somewhat muted in his nationalism. In February, as many of you know, he visited the United States and held rallies for migrant workers. While blasting Trump for his anti-migrant wall-building postures, he took care not to criticize the United States overall. He told a Los Angeles crowd, California is a refuge and blessing for immigrants. His frequently firebrand oratory, which sometimes recalls that of Venezuela's Hugo Chavez, is a great part of the attraction to many AMLO devotees. He likes to refer to the PRI and the PAN as the mafia of power. Policy-wise, however, López Obrador currently seems keener to follow the more moderate path of Latin America's other leading leftist of the new century, former Brazilian president Luis Inácio da Silva, Lula. At the start of this year, AMLO enlisted several prominent businessmen to his inner circle of advisors. Yet, as the July 2018 election draws closer, tightness or slippage in the polls may prompt López Obrador to revive some of the us and them rhetoric towards the United States that he used in 2006. Those swings in public opinion polls about the United States suggest there are votes in such language perhaps not enough to lock an absolute majority, 
but enough to finesse the difference in a race that looks to be highly fragmented between the PRI, Morena, the Pan-PRD Movimiento Ciudadano Alliance, which may well split up before the election, plus as many as six independent candidates, though it's doubtful that all will accumulate sufficient signatures to qualify for the ballot. One ready vehicle for rabble-rousing is the oil sector, whose opening to foreign investment has been a, signa a signature reform of President Peña Nieto. The effects are starting to be seen, not only in the January, uh, January price hike, but in the debut of foreign-branded gas stations. You can see them now in Mexico, in Mexico City and elsewhere. When Peña Nieto first published his proposal, López Obrador led the street protests. In other words, there's a continuity of, of, of opposition to the, to the oil reform um, by López Obrador, much more so than in the uh, rhetoric of any other candidate. Among his staunchest supporters was, of course, Proceso, which would run numerous cover stories opposing the reform. In August 2014, when it became law, the magazine's verdict was simple, la entrega, in other words, the handover. That is, so its lead article made clear, to the gringos. And what then? Would a President AMLO succumb to the temptation a la Venezuela's Chavez and Nicolas Maduro of blaming the United States whenever times are tough? Or would he rather, like Lula and his successor Dilma, prefer to denounce opposition politicians at home? As long as Trump is in the White House, the easier option will likely be to point a scolding finger at the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, lots of food for thought there. Um, before we kick off the discussion, I'm going to ask uh, Chris to, uh, to give us some thoughts based upon his uh, research and, uh, and, uh, and Andrew's comments. Great. Thanks, Duncan. And Andrew, thanks so much for that, that great presentation. I think it's a perfect use of history to inform a current question in public policy and what we're looking at right now. So it's really well done. Appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to try to be brief so we can have more time for conversation and just uh, say four things or bring up four questions and points. I guess my, my big one is the, the question would be how different is Mexico today than Mexico of the past in terms of, you know, obviously uh, anti-Americanism has been used politically in Mexico in the past. And you bring up the question. You've, you've already addressed it to a certain extent, but I just thought I'd reflect on it a bit. I mean... Looking at Mexican public opinion since the 90s, since NAFTA was put in place, essentially, we've seen basically steady improvement across many different variables in terms of Mexican perception of the U.S. There have been some dips. The Iraq war was certainly the cause of one of them. Mm -hmm. And now what happened last year during the elections and, and current policy issues on the table from President Trump is a second uh, very clear example of that. Um, but that said, I, I guess I would just say I think that things have changed quite a bit. And there may be space, you know, some resilience uh, within Mexican opinion of the U.S. that exists today that couldn't have existed previously uh, because of the level of integration that we have. And some places where we see things related to that, young people in Mexico have more, much more positive opinion towards the United States than older people. So clearly the experience that people have, you know, what they've lived through in terms of the environment of U.S.-Mexico relations makes a big difference. Um, Northerners, those who live closer to the United States, have much more positive opinion of the United States and Mexico. Uh, those who have visited the United States have much more positive opinion of the United States. And remember that it, a huge percentage of Mexicans have now visited or lived in the United States because of integration, not just through economic terms, not just through NAFTA, but because of migration uh, between the countries. And the other interesting one is that wealthier people in Mexico tend to have a better opinion of the United States. You have these, you know, different, some, some level of division within society, but within that, you know, several of those, not so much the wealthier uh, one, that one that actually does lend itself to be utilized as a tool for, you know, expressing anti-Americanism and utilizing that politically. The rest of them resist it, I would say, because young people, that's the future of any political party. You need young voters if you want to have a future. Uh, those who have more experience with the United States, well, just more people have experience with the United States, so there's a, a resilience in that as well. Uh, so I think that's an interesting thing. To the, the, the second thing that I want to bring up is a question of whether or not Mexico, Mexican opinion of the United States is polarized enough along party lines to be utilized 
uh, by the different parties. Mm -hmm. And one thing I can say is it's not nearly as polarized as U.S. opinion of Mexico uh, or U.S. opinion on migration or on NAFTA. I mean, we have in the United States a tremendously increasing level of political polarization that plays very importantly in U.S.-Mexico relations and the way that that gets inserted into U.S. politics, which we saw happen very clearly this last time around. In Mexico, I don't have the 2017 numbers for Mexico yet. I, sh I should have them soon. But in 2015, there was an 11-point spread between those supporters of the PRD and how they viewed the United States, 11 points lower than supporters of the PAN, which were the high, actually the, than the PRI, which was the highest of the three in 2015. That's important, mm -hmm. that's a difference, could maybe be exploited. But in the United States, it's 33 point difference mm -hmm. between Republicans and Democrats and their views of Mexico. So not nearly the same level of political polarization. And I, I guess another thing related to that that I, I thought was interesting to, to think about a bit is that, you know, Maybe in Mexico, there is a greater split at the level of the elites, you know, those who run those magazines, those who, you know, those who uh, lead opinion in certain ways, but I'm not sure that people are following them in opinion. It seems to me, as you actually expressed, that it's actions from the United States that have the greatest impact on Mexican opinion of the United States, who our president is, what policies they're endorsing, what type of rhetoric that they're using, and that for the, for the Mexican leaders, it's not so much their ability, the, their ability is not so much to drive opinion of the United States as it is to perhaps, if the conditions are correct, to take advantage of that for domestic political purposes. Um, one thing it just makes me reflect on is that that leaves the ball in the U.S. court, largely, as to this question of to what level this will drive Mexican politics. Well, it, it's up to the context of U.S.-Mexican relations to determine whether or not that's feasible, mm -hmm. essentially. And that, that is, of course, something that U.S. leaders have significant control over. Uh, the, the third question or sort of issue to, to raise was, you know, can AMLO, is he well positioned to stoke anti-Americanism? Uh, and I, I guess what, what I mean by that is, obviously he's well positioned to be the beneficiary of anti-Americanism. Uh, when Trump won the election last year, he immediately got a bump in the polls. I mean, th there, you know, we see that he's well positioned in that sense, but is it dangerous for him to embrace that and try to stoke it in return, right? Is it dangerous for him to, if, you know, as you put the question, Lula or Chavez, you know, maybe being, you know, allowing himself to be painted as a Chavez, a figure who's utilizing anti-Americanism, mm -hmm. is just the thing that he needs to avoid mm -hmm. in order to win the elections. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, in fact, that's the critique, that's, that's precisely the critique that's been used of him over time. The attack line is, he will be the Chavez of Mexico. Mm -hmm. And that's been a, you know, a negative perception that he right. has to combat. So maybe he has to combat that by being careful uh, about playing the, the, the gringophobia card. Sure. Um, and so that's something I think we should, we should look at, and, and some, pieces of public opinion that, that maybe lend credence to that way in which he may need to at least be careful uh, is that Mexican support NAFTA, uh, one of the main policies connecting the two countries. Already, I think that's driven him to be careful in his critiques of NAFTA. Mexicans have a positive opinion. Did this, and these are all uh, 2017 polling points, so sure. post-Trump you know, world polling points. Positive opinion of NAFTA positive opinion of the, uh, the nature of economic ties with the United States, and uh, positive response to a question of whether or not the United States and Mexico should cooperate on issues of joint concern. Mm -hmm. Strong preference for, 70% preference for joint problem solving between the two countries. So again, just pointing to this level of resilience that's out there or positivity that's out there now that maybe wasn't there historically that could act as a buffer or a block to utilizing uh, anti-gringo sentiment politically. And I think I sort of covered the fourth one actually as I went along, the Chavez or Lula question. So, so that, yeah, I mean the question of, of whether or not it would work essentially. I'm gonna okay. stop there, thanks a lot. Thank you, Chris. And just uh, to, to, to add in my five cents worth, I, I think it was intriguing when, when Andres Manuel was here at the Wilson Center a few months ago and uh, during his presentation, the, uh, the DACA announcement was made by mm -hmm. President Trump and a reporter asked him to comment on it. And he resisted the temptation mm -hmm. to launch an attack on President Trump. Instead, he said, you know, I disagree with the decision, but with all due respect, I will not comment or I will not interfere in the internal affairs of, a, of another country. Which I thought was, I mean, it's a classic Mexican pre-Easter response. Mm 
Um, but the fact that he was able to resist that temptation, and partly maybe it was Mexican um, politeness not to criticize uh, the president of the country in which you're uh, presenting at that particular point, point in time. But I thought it was, it was interesting that he resisted that, that temptation. Mm -hmm. So, Andrew, um, I'd, I'd like to give you the chance to respond to Chris's comments, but I'd also like to take a couple of questions, if you don't mind, okay. so we can really get things uh, running. Guy, first of all. Do we have a microphone for this coming over? I'll pass you the question. Sorry, there we go. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, building on something Chris said, if you could, could introduce yourself, Guy, just Guy or Berkeley Research Group. Uh, building on something Chris said, could you? Uh, quantify or at least comment on the pull or the influence <coughs> of Proceso and La Jornada compared to other channels of communication in Mexico, print, electronic, media, social media, et cetera, given uh, today's world, not uh, 20, 30 years ago. Thank you. And I think the gentleman beside you had a question, so uh, why don't we take that one straight away? Thank you. I'm Ricardo Castillo from the George Washington University. You have only talked about AMLO, but there is a chance that the other candidates uh, will have uh, to talk about the about about the gringos in the upcoming elections, uh, based on the ongoing uh, NAFTA uh, mm -hmm. well, trade negotiations. Well, based on the premise that there is a chance that the current finance minister is is the candidate of of the PRI, mm -hmm. now Jose Antonio Meade, yeah. and also the president of PAN, who has uh, an important chance of becoming the the candidate of PAN, has been very uh, front very vocal about the about the about the about the past visit of Trump to to Mexico no? so so it's not only about AMLO there is a chance that the other candidates will also put some some flame into into the discussion mm -hmm. thank you Andrew okay uh, one second right I, I think it's uh, I think you're absolutely right that the, the the there has been something of a sea change uh, since the 90s with so many Mexicans having been to the United States uh, as I mentioned in the talk, um, uh, the, the, that circular migration we've seen, people, you know, millions going, but millions also coming back and informing friends and family that, you know, Uncle Sam is not the great Satan after all. Uh, the tourism, a uh, huge amount of tourism, which accounts in part for why wealthy Mexicans are, um, are generally pro-American. Um, but I think it's really important that we, that we understand that the 11-point spread you mentioned between the PRI and the PRD is a 2015 statistic. So, you know, we, we need to see what the stats are for this year. And uh, we also need to take into account that the PRD is no longer the flagship party of the left. It's now Morena. Um, so uh, I, 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 think, I think there is um, there's definitely a potential for uh, Lopez Obrador and Morena in general to, I think, selectively be use, uh, use a selective anti-Americanism. Uh, I, I think, um, uh, think Amlo is, is, is quite smart in his, in his rhetoric. He's often derided for being uh, clumsy, uh, rhetorically clumsy, but, I, but uh, when it comes to the United States, I think he's quite savvy. So for example, um, he, he doesn't tend, even back in 2006, he wasn't, ten, he wasn't making explicit anti-American declarations. They tended to be much more implicit. The pride in not speaking in English, the pride in not having visited the United States, which I don't think he did until uh, the beginning of this year, if I, if I recall cor correctly. Uh, also, the, um, the fact that he named his, his, his youngest son after Ernesto Guevara, the fact that he, uh, you know, will praise from time to time Chavez or even Maduro. This is, um, I I it's a sort of implicit standing up to the United States. Now, there's also the criticism of the energy reform, which he's been doing for many, many years. Um, I, think, I think he's going to identify certain uh, points of contention, such as energy reform, uh, such as uh, US investment in, in other areas, uh, aspects of NAFTA, not NAFTA as a whole. You mentioned that Mexicans are in favor of NAFTA, but it's not a huge majority. It's about 55%. It's, yeah, 60-40, I think. It's uh, up, but it probably depends yeah, on polls, I'm sure. Right, right. I, I saw 55-45. But, but yeah, so I, I think he can, he can launch a selective criticism of NAFTA and, and be quite effective on, on, on that count. Um, the media question. Uh, La Jornada uh, and Proceso are respectively the most important left-wing newspaper and the most important magazine, in fact, of any uh, kind in, in, um, in Mexico in terms of shaping public opinion. There are uh, uh, websites, um, 
the, 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 I would say the leading uh, websites in Mexico, which have a, a um, not only in terms of their credibility, but also numbers of followers on Twitter, numbers of followers on Facebook, where people increasingly getting their news, are Animal Politico and Sin Embargo, and they both skew left. Uh, uh, the, the single most consulted, visited uh, news website in Mexico is, uh, partly because it's, it's sort of trashy, um, is, uh, is a site called SDB Noticias, which was founded by an AMLO sympathizer after the 2006 election and is still pretty AMLO in its, um, uh, in its tone. So uh, there are, there's a substantial uh, amount of social media um, uh, support for AMLO. Uh, I would say it's more passionate than the support for any other uh, a candidate, uh, again, driven by the young. Um, where, where AMLO has his biggest, uh, and traditionally has had his biggest uh, uh, obstacle, is in uh, wooing the support of the TV companies. Uh, the TV companies very much, and Televisa in particular, backed uh, um, Calderon in 2006, obviously cultivated and backed Peña Nieto in 2012, but if you go back to the, 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 the first years of the century, when AMLO was Mexico City mayor, before the video scandal uh, of 2004, when some of his uh, cabinet, his Mexico City cabinet were caught on camera receiving cash payments. Um, up until that time, Televisa's coverage of AMLO was pretty uh, neutral, in fact, somewhat positive. And uh, it's interesting to know that earlier, at the beginning of this year, SDP Noticias, the, the, the uh, website that I mentioned, which has, I think, the highest traffic of any news site in Mexico, um, was 50% bought by Televisa. So it seems that Televisa is, is, you know, might be starting to, uh, they also bought Deforma, which is the most popular satirical website in Mexico. Um, uh, so it seems that Televisa is now hedging its bets, which it has done before. Uh, and so it may be the case that if, if, uh, if AMLO looks like he's, he's uh, at least, you know, there's a strong chance of him get gaining elected, getting elected, then, then he's not going to face the, the criticism, the veiled criticism or the, you know, the, uh, the third party advertising which, is, which has likened him to Chavez in the past, that kind of thing. That, that may not be a factor in next year's election. Uh, and finally, um, other candidates. Yes, it's true. Other candidates can play the national sovereignty card, uh, but I don't think they can do so with as much authority as AMLO. Anaya, for example, who you mentioned, Anaya, the leader of the PAN. Uh, yes, he was critical on Trump's visit, but he also sends his kids to school in Florida. So, you know, <laughs> he's got a number of Achilles. Is it Atlanta? Yeah. So he's got a number of Achilles heels that uh, uh, Lopez Obrador could, could exploit. Thank you. Let me just uh, make one follow. I think it was very interesting that um, during the U.S. election campaign, you saw politicians from all of the major parties actually coming out with a much more nationalistic approach to uh, um, to foreign relations. I mean, people such as uh, Senator Gabby Cuevas, for example, who has always been very internationalist, adopted a much more nationalistic tone. Um, Armando Rios Pita from the left, of yep. course. Um, and even somebody like Agustin Barrios Gomez, who is such a, you know, a, a vocal proponent of, of North America, mm -hmm. um, has become much more critical of, uh, of the United States mm -hmm. um, uh, over the past uh, few months. And I think that there was a, there was a reason behind all this, which was you, none of the political parties wanted to cede that nationalistic ground to Andres Manuel. Mm. They wanted to make sure that they were present there. And they also recognized that if there is gonna be a more nationalistic tone in uh, Mexican and in international politics, then we wanna be part of that to get That's the votes right. that are there. Yeah. And, and they have to work harder to do that they do. than they do. They do. AMLO who gets it naturally, mm -hmm. right? If it mm -hmm. happens naturally for him and maybe he has to be careful about yeah. it, we might even you know, look to see stronger utilization of that type of rhetoric from mm -hmm. some of the other candidates. Microphone's coming behind you, sorry. Other side. Dorlia Chavez, I'm a reporter. Uh, I just have a little bit of trouble um, seeing or foreseeing next year's election mm -hmm. when we already know who the candidate is for the pre in the, uh, in the uh, Frente, if they manage to agree on someone and, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and or the pan in the PRD. Um, that the Trump 
let's leave aside the U.S., mm -hmm. but whether Trump will play a role in their rhetoric. Because as polls indicate, um, Trump is highly unpopular. Mm -hmm. So there's no need. It seems to me that the whole discussion mm -hmm. is going to be more, as it has been in the past, on internal issues, on corruption, mm -hmm. on impunity, on violation of co uh, the whole economic problems, and so forth. So I, I don't see much need for any of the candidates, including AMLO, to play the anti-American, i.e. the uh, anti-Trump uh, uh -huh. uh, card. Mm -hmm. I might be wrong. And in terms of the uh, NAFTA, I want to ask uh, Chris to what extent this um, pro-NAFTA that you said it was 60-something or 50-something percent, it's more an anti-Trump to the extent that Trump attacks just about every day NAFTA, obviously uh, it, it's a reflection of, okay, if he's against NAFTA, and then we better support NAFTA. I don't know to what extent mm -hmm. the uh, polls change right. when, uh, when, uh, when NAFTA became, you know, the, the piñata of Mr. Trump. So uh, let's take a question from Patricia. I, I like your logic, though, Dolia. If you could get Donald Trump to come out against the energy reform, then Mexicans might actually be in favor of it. There you go. I, I think it's, it's an intriguing idea. Uh, Patricia Escamilla Ham, Border uh, Policy Network. And my question is about the difference or the similarities between the gringophobia and let me put it, let me call it Mexicophobia in the United States. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to using that uh, anti-Mexico or anti-US um, sentiment, negative sentiment in Mexico um, on the US, what's the difference? Because Trump has not only used that sentiment, but uh, has fueled it in the US to, uh, for political purposes. So what would be the difference? between one or the other, or, the, or are they similar? Thank you. Well, we've got time for one more question. If anybody else uh, has a burning issue, yes, sit over here. Uh, yeah, yeah, Eric Palladini, uh, formerly of the World Bank. Um, I was wondering if you'd put in context of that Enrique Krause's uh, op-ed piece in the New York Times in January of this year, entitled, and I had to look it up, uh, Trump Threatens a Good Neighbor, in which he takes a different point of view from that. Thanks. Okay, um, I'll, I'll take the last one first because it's the easiest to respond. I, I don't recall the article. C could could you could you rephrase the question? Just to, what was the thesis of that article? Well, uh, Enrique Krause writes uh, that uh, that it's well. Actually, I can get it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, while you're doing so, um, let me ask uh, answer one of two of the others. Um, we we'll say uh, mexophobia and gringophobia are they are they the same? Well, they they may be they may have s uh, certain uh, rhetorical similarities, but um, I argue that that, that um, let me let me think about this one second. I, I, yes, I think that I, th I think that actually they they do have a lot in common because my argument is that gringophobia, this, this strain of anti-Americanism as as I defined it, is is uh, is an emotive. Uh, form of, of, of nationalism that is uh, used very much, um, conducted from above for political purposes, and and that was the case I think with uh, with the mexophobia um, uh, generated by Trump. It was it was definitely done with uh, with a um, electoral uh, expediency in mind, and um, and this is this has been the case with uh, gringophobia uh, not only this year but in the past in Mexico. Uh, there have been certain times, uh, I mentioned the, during the Cold War under Lopez Mateos, when uh, gringophobia was, was uh, um, accentuated, let's say, by, um, by certain politicians, again, for, for policy purposes, uh, uh, with the ultimate idea of, of, of uh, pushing Lopez Mateos to, to, to select a, a more liberal, um, or destapar a more liberal successor. Um, obviously, that didn't happen. Um, so yes, I, I think they're, they're both they're both uh, engineered or, 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 or channeled for political expediency. Um, the uh, 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 Dolly's question about the um, uh, j just how, how likely is it? Well, I, I think that 
well, if this 65% uh, of Mexicans who hold an unfavorable opinion of the United States, that's, that's September. Um, if that figure holds or possibly even increases due to factors that Mexicans basically can't control, which is the rhetoric coming out of, of, um, of Washington and uh, Mr. Trump's Twitter feed and so forth, uh, then that, that, that implies there is a margin of operation because of the fragmentation of the field. Uh, by which I mean that it may well be the case that whoever wins next year's election uh, does so with only 30% of the vote. So if 65% of Mexicans hold a negative opinion of the United States, there's definitely political mileage to be gained from a certain degree of anti-American rhetoric. So yes, I, I think it's, I think it's um, quite possible. I'm not saying it will be a factor, but it's quite possible for it to be a factor. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry for being a bomb thrower here, but um, <laughs> did, didn't mean that. Um, uh, his first two sentences can, can summarize what he says. For Mexico, the U.S. has been a difficult neighbor, sometimes violent, almost always arrogant, almost never respectful, rarely cooperative. Mexico, on the other hand, has been a good neighbor to the United States. To each offense, we have responded first with a gesture of noble resignation, and then by searching for a practical resolution through a conciliatory openness of mind. And then it goes on from there. Uh, that gives you a general sense of what he's trying to say. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I think I would broadly agree um, that, that Mexico has, has been a good neighbor, and um, certainly uh, Mexican, Mexico's presidents have tended to be uh, not only um, fairly um, friendly towards the United States in their, in their rhetoric, but, but, but behind the scenes often pretty deferential, uh, that, uh, certainly since Salinas. I think there was a, I think there was something I think it was quite a pronounced change in fact between De La Madrid and Salinas. De La Madrid famously for example refusing US aid after the 1985 earthquake. Uh, so you have a, you have a quite a change under Salinas and I think that is a continuity in Mexican politics in, uh, since then. Um, there is this uh, there is a neoliberal orthodoxy now within um, obviously within the PAN and within the dominant sector of the PRI. It's not pre wide as you know there are there are, there are the traditionalists within the PRI who are less enthused. But um, it is looking increasingly like Meade will be the candidate, and he's from that neoliberal, well, he's, you know, he worked under, under Calderon as well as Peña Nieto. So um, in, in, in terms of measuring the quality of the friendship, I, I, you know, there is a counter argument to say that uh, political ineptitude in, for example, dealing with the narco cartels, has has done both countries uh, a disservice. So uh, I think uh, Krause is is simplifying, uh, but I generally agree with him. Yeah. Just to back him up, I would say if anybody who's read the transcript of the telephone conversation between Presidents Trump and Peña Nieto from from January, I mean, you see exactly how much uh, self restraint uh, President Peña Nieto exercised during that phone call. It's it's quite extraordinary. Um, given the uh, what was coming at the other end, yeah, <coughs> exactly. Yeah, but he was he was very restrained. He behaved in a in a very polite and respectful fashion. Enrique, Enrique, that's right, that's right. <laughs> so, in response to your question, Dolia, is Mexican public opinion on NAFTA response to Trump? No, it's been solid. I mean, that that support predates Trump. And, and there hasn't been anything we've seen so far that suggests a real change. I mean, that's the interesting thing, is that there hasn't been a change in either direction uh, or noticeable one as a result of the election. That level of support's been there. And, and if I can just make a couple other quick responses, too. I mean, I'd say that the, the atmosphere in U.S.-Mexico relations, what's going on in U.S.-Mexico relations will be extraordinarily important in, to the extent that the U.S. Mexico relationship becomes a campaign issue. That's to say that if the NAFTA negotiations are wrapped up and everything's sort of back to uh, a, a more friendly atmosphere, you know, then yeah, then what is there to gain? I mean, obviously you're right that domestic issues will be the number one, two, three, and probably four issues in the campaign, right? I mean, corruption, poverty, crime, things like that will dominate the campaign. 
and, and that's normal in an election anywhere. It's very rare that foreign relations become a dominant issue in an election, in, in the United States certainly, in a country that's very active around the world. We don't see it. So to see that in Mexico would be quite surprising. Uh, but that doesn't mean it can't matter, right? I mean, it can certainly, even as a you know, fourth or fifth tier issue, be something that has an impact on the outcome of the elections. And I think that's what we should be looking for. But yeah, I would just say that you know, the, the candidates will have to respond to whatever statements come from the U.S. president, whatever actions are taken by the U.S. administration that are important to Mexico during the campaign. So th those types of things will dictate the extent to which it becomes a significant campaign issue or not in the elections. Um, and, and then just on the difference between U.S. opinion and Mexico or, or you know, gringophobia and anti-Mexican opinion, that type of a thing. I mean, fear of others is used politically everywhere uh, all around the world. And, and so, of course, that's what we're both doing, right, when we use these things for political purposes. Um, Mexico, I think, became very much a symbol for U.S. insecurity and US, the U.S. encounter with globalization. Uh, and I think it worked very well as that because it taps on both the economic dimensions of globalization, trade, NAFTA, outsourcing, all of these types of issues, and also on the people-to-people -people side of globalization, immigration, people coming into my community from around the world and making it look and feel different than it was before. Uh, you know, the United States, it doesn't do those exact same things in, in Mexico, but the, the United States can, to a certain extent, also sum up Mexico's experience with globalization. Uh, and so in that sense, I think there is, there is a parallel there, for sure. But the, the thing that I mentioned before that struck me as very different about the two is the level of po polarization, uh, especially by party ID, that we see. I mean, that is just, it's just stunning in the United States, the way issues like NAFTA and migration and Mexico were nonpartisan issues 10 years ago. There was no difference, no significant difference in US public opinion on any of those topics 10 years ago. And now there are huge partisan divides on those issues, divides in terms of rural urban, divides in terms of other key variables in terms of our demographics. We just don't see that same level of polarization occurring in Mexico. And it means that those topics don't lend themselves to be used politically quite as easily when you don't have that level of polarization to begin with. And so I think it's not as simple for it to be used in Mexico as it, is, as it has been vice versa. Uh, that's it. Thank you, Chris. I'm afraid, I know there's a couple more questions, but I'm afraid we've run out of time. So if you'd like to grab Andrew as soon as we're finished, I think that would be the best thing. Let me take this opportunity to thank you all for being here. And um, particularly thank you to Andrew and to Chris uh, for participating in this conversation. Um, on Thursday of this week, we'll have Mexican pollster Jorge Buendia here to talk about the, uh, the current state of the, uh, the race for the 2018 uh, presidency in Mexico. So uh, our coverage of Mexican politics and Mexican elections will continue apace. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.